In the 18th century, Britain was still a rural society. Most people still lived in very poor conditions in the countryside, and the majority of work was available on the land in small village communities. The Industrial Revolution enabled the development of mass production in factories and concentrated the workforce into urban centres, where there was power for the engines in the form of water and coal to make steam, and access to raw materials with good transport facilities. Seaside resorts had been made fashionable in the 18th century as spa towns because of their health-giving properties. In 1750, Dr Russell's dissertation on the use of seawater in the diseases of the glands convinced many doctors and patients that drinking and bathing in seawater could help cure many conditions, and the patronage of the seaside by the Prince Regent in the 1790s meant it became very fashionable to aspire towards the healthy, wealthy lifestyle epitomised at the seaside resort. The development of the railways from the 1860s onwards meant that large numbers of people could be moved swiftly and cheaply to a variety of destinations, including the seaside resorts. Then, in 1871, the Bank Holiday Act introduced the concept of holidays with pay, with national holidays created on Boxing Day, Easter Monday, Whit Monday and on the first Monday in August. This meant that a growing urban working class of factory workers and service workers were able to take holiday without either losing their job or losing their income. The trippers came to the seaside for the health-giving properties of sea bathing, fresh air, or ozone as they called it, and adventure. The seaside has been a place for exotic excitement ever since the Prince Regent created the astonishing pleasure domes of Brighton Pavilion in the early 19th century. This giddy atmosphere of innovation and thrill has continued throughout the British seaside's history. It's often at the seaside that inventions are first tried out. For example, the first electric railway, the first electric street lighting, technological feats such as Blackpool Tower, the incredible engineering achievements of the seaside pleasure piers, the largest ferris wheels, the sauciest what the butler saws, the newest arcade games, and now the most extreme water sports such as parasending or kiteboarding. It's also where romance and sauciness abound. The seaside is a great leveller. When sunbathing in a bathing costume or dripping from a dip in the sea, class, social standing and wealth become meaningless. The seaside postcard tradition of dirty weekends and embarrassing situations are pretty close to the seaside experience itself. Clothes and inhibitions are both abandoned, making us anonymous and vulnerable at the same time. It's in this context that the holiday crowds went to see the seaside entertainers. And what a range of entertainment there was. Donkeys, Punch and Judy, German bands, who advisedly changed their name to Umpa or brass bands with the advent of the First World War, beach orators, jugglers, barrel organs, trick cyclists, escapologists and many, many more. The Piero troops and concert parties were unusual because they directly engaged with their audiences. They produced an ensemble show of family fun designed specifically for the holiday crowds. In style, form and content, they were perfectly adapted for the British seaside. And because of this, they were fantastically successful. The development of cheap air flights, package holidays and the disruption of social behaviour brought about by the Second World War changed the holidaying habits of the interwar years. The Pieros and concert parties were one of Britain's last oral cultures. Little is recorded in book or paper form, let alone on film or tape. But as can be seen by the postcards of the era, they were hugely popular and an essential part of our cultural heritage. <laughs>